Hey, Jimmy. <laughs> this is a present from me and only me. You and only you. Yeah, Sean will try to take credit, but... Um, nice accessory. It's not an accessory, it's part of me. <laughs> Am I supposed to read this? I guess. <laughs> In lieu of sending beef jerky and other Kentucky treats to your office, I have instead decided to provide a gift to aid in the culture of the office. I refuse to have a boss that represents me and vice versa wearing the same shoes as the pigeon poop jacketed homeless lady from Home Alone 2. Okay, <laughs> these are year old lugs. They cost me like 25 Canadian. Consider this my version of turtle dove ornaments, except they don't suck and you can wear them. Sign Sean Ross up. How does he even know my shoe size? Unless you got some kind of a slipper or something. So what you might have done. You might need to pause while I open because this could take a lot of time. We got you scissors. We got you scissors. Oh, you got me scissors. I probably don't need scissors. <laughs> Ten and a half? Eh, might be close. Might be close. Uh -uh. <laughs> Ooh, aren't those fancy? They so don't match anything I ever wear. Wow, way more expensive than what I would typically do. Very nice. Air Jordan, thanks, Sean Rossap. Thanks very much. I'm stylish now. They don't, you know. Again, I don't know. I think they're gonna fit. Oh, yeah, they might be a little narrow. I think that, Lengthwise, I think they'll be okay. Uh, they look pretty see. similar. Yeah, I'll try them. I'll try them. Yeah, they're actually nice. Thanks <laughs> for trying to up my fashion sense. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's the list and your boy with Jimmy Van and Sean Ross. It's Christmas Day, Jimmy. It is December 25th. It is absolutely not December 11th. You came to the office. I came upstairs to my office. Yeah. We're giving the people an episode of Listen, Ya Boy. Came here just for this. Then I'm going to immediately head home on December 25th. Uh, and on uh, December, what's the other one? Uh, Nova uh, uh, Christmas, no, New Year's Day. That's it. Yeah. New Year's Day. Maybe maybe they'll get a show New Year's Day. I don't maybe. I don't know. Okay. Maybe. But this is the collector's edition of Listen Your Boy. We're gonna take a look at Jimmy Van's LJN collection. Dare I say, Jimmy, one of the biggest, most eclectic in the world. When it comes to LJNs, it is the most complete in the world, and I can say that confidently. Confidently. Yes. Not many things that Jimmy Van can say confidently. Yeah. More confidently, right. but we can say this. Take a look. Jimmy Van's LJN collection. We're here at Jimmy Van's house. I'm going to check out his LJN collection. Now, I don't know a ton about LJNs, uh -huh. so you're going to kind of tell me a little bit about them. I'll watch through it a little bit. I, I'm really excited. I, I The first wrestling action figure I had, no surprise, yep. Hillbilly Jim LJN. Yep, it's around here somewhere. Hillbilly Jim LJN. You've got one of, quite frankly, the most eclectic LJN collections in the world. So I, yeah, I've, got, I've got them all in the package. Hillbilly, so some of them I had to I had to stack because I didn't have enough uh, cabinet space. So the Hillbilly Gym might be stacked behind another one right now. Oh, it's up there. That's fantastic. I remember that yeah, one. Hillbilly's right there, yeah. yeah. So as we look through here, I mean, there are a lot of people who I didn't even realize had figures because I grew up in the Hasbro era. Yep. And things were uh, a little bit different in that regard. Right. Well, like SD Jones, I didn't know he had a figure. They may too. So this, I, this one has a, you know what? I can open some of these cabinets. Yeah, I would love that. This one has- Can I uh, open some of the figures, Jimmy? Uh, if you do, you're leaving immediately. Oh man. This one, see, they made two. Oh, wow. One with a purple shirt and one with a Hawaiian yeah, shirt. Yeah, it has a Hawaiian shirt on. Yeah, that's right. Not one of the more rare figures, not very expensive. And I look at this, I, I wouldn't have realized that Terry Funk had an action figure. Terry Funk had an action figure too? Now, tell me, yeah, I, I, see, I see the skin tone differences up here uh -huh. um, between Savage. Yes. Like one of those, like his legs are a little bit thicker. Uh, well, I'm gonna explain. I'll explain this one. So there's a there's a phenomenon in in this world called variance. Yeah. What that means is when something is different between them. And this one here, what we think happened is they did not put flesh tone color in the rubber. Okay. When they produced it, and I had people look at this. I had supposed experts look at this that thought, oh, it's probably just sun damage. Yeah. But once they saw it and discovered that the bubble is not yellow and the paint is not changed, okay. 
they were convinced that it was just a screw up at the factory and they didn't put flesh tone in the rubber. But as far as I know, this is the only one that exists. Like now, that. I see several of these that are two, maybe three deep. Can you yes. tell me the story behind maybe some of those? Probably variants. Yeah. So, for example, uh, me and Gene Okerlund up here, there's two of them. And there were just slight differences. See how the card is different? Yeah. Between the two? This one has doubt we have logos on the microphone. Oh, wow. That one does yeah. not. So slight variance between them. So I collect all of them. And that's why I have them stacked usually because of the variant like that. I see a couple Lucy's around here. I know this guy, Adrian yeah. Adonis. I've got a few that, uh, that one uh, I originally owned when I was, whenever that came out, when I was 10 mm -hmm. uh, or 12 or whatever. And then these are ones that I just happened to like. This one here was not produced by LGN. Mm -hmm. That was produced by Hasbro uh, because Slaughter left WWE to go to Hasbro. And he was a G.I. Joe. I was going to say that he looks more like Joe. the caricature of the G.I. Joe. Yeah, Slaughter, Slaughter. Never, Slaughter never had that physique. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Needless to say. But they Hasbro created this because they were trying to uh, get, get a rub, basically, off the popularity of the LGN. Of course. That's why they made it. And you can only get it as a mail away. And okay. if you notice here, if you take a look at this, if I can get them, there are spots on here. I was about to ask about that. What happened was it was a mail away and, and supposedly the factory where they kept these, there was water damage. Okay. And because a different kind of rubber was used for this than for the LJNs, the water damage left permanent marks on it. That is fantastic. Yeah, so that's what happened. The thing I like as I'm looking at all these LJNs, the physiques are Pretty spot on for a lot of them. They, oh yeah, Hogan was definitely that skinny. Well, I mean, for like, sure. there, there's more of a difference in the physique than definitely, like, say, the Jack Pacific's bone crunchers that existed a, yes. a decade and a half later. I mean, like, Haku's pretty, pretty similar, I think. I mean, like, Junkyard Dog has a little pot yeah, belly up does, there. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I see a little Some bit more. There's a little bit more difference there in yeah. that regard. And the like, old Andre as well. The old Andre. Kind of yeah. look like the the real Andre the Giant. Like for example, Hillbilly Jim. If that were a Jack Pacific Bone Cruncher, it would have like just it had a body up. and painted up, just painted over a, a basic body. Yes. You, like you had the Undertaker who was thinner yes. than Edge and skinnier than Edge, and yes. it was like it looked really really weird. I mean, these ones were kind of a lot more cartoonish, yeah. you know, to a degree as well. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I was, I was. It was the first thing I ever collected, and once I had the means to be able to get them on the package, I just kind of went nuts, and so I have them all. So these are, are more that you just kind of are, are partial to and that you like. Yep, uh, the Andre was the first. That particular Andre is the first figure that I ever collected. That's a great Andre. It's decent. Well, I. Use... I mean, I mean, just like from like looking at it, because it's different. Like yeah. you don't see that gear so many people that grew up in my era remember him for the single strap and yes. all that stuff but no this was circa like the look they used with the hair that was probably circa 83 84 it came out in uh, late 84 i believe and i actually had to trade with a friend at school to get that and i still have it after all these years and i also see i believe these are awa rimcos these are the AWA Remco. These are making kind of a comeback. This style. Are, oh, are they really? Yeah, yeah. I guess. Well, the, the new uh, the new line WWE has. Yeah, they kind of similar. They these are kind of cool too, but I think they're kind of cool for the opposite reason that I think LJNs are cool is that they're all uniform. They're yes. All the same, but they have different heads. Like, look at this ref. Yep. I gotta say, Dick Worley. That's Dick one Worley. jacked dick. Yeah. <laughs> that's one jacked dick right there. They also had clothing. These guys had clothing. Yeah, like actual cloth. Actual cl clothing, and there's a there's a Shawn Michaels and a Mario Gennetti in there. I gotta say, the Buddy Rose never looked better. Yeah, Buddy Rose, and actually, I'll I'll give you a little piece of trivia, Sean. Of all the figures that I have in my entire collection, with the exception maybe of that prototype Slaughter mm -hmm. that we'll talk about, the most rare one of my entire set is in this cabinet. Ooh. And what do you think is the most rare figure? I only know of I think three that exist in the package. How many, what do you think is the most rare one? In this cabinet and among the Remco's? No, it's the oh, most okay. rare of, of anything. No, I no, have. no. I mean just like, is it a Remco? Yes. Oh, okay. well, I just said it's in this cabinet. Mm. If that were... Oh, man. I, I would assume it's not one of these since it's a tag team. You said one. But maybe I'm I could have one package. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, I'm going to say this great Ganya Kurt Hennig camo set. <laughs> It's actually the Boris Zukov. Okay. The Boris Zukov is incredibly rare. 
uh, because they didn't make a lot of that Matt Mania set. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, getting into the package, and especially in this condition, it's pretty much mint condition. Even the, the, the card is unpunched, which is rare. It's uh, yeah, it's a very hard one to get. I have had offers for that. I won't even tell you for how much. I really dig the Janetti and Shawn Michaels figures. And yeah, they're cool. Yeah. When I still would collect some wrestling merchandise and stuff, I loved Road Warrior stuff. So theirs is kind of cool. They look like they're wearing karate pants. Yeah, a little bit. They look like they are about to be uh, superstar Billy Graham's. Yes. Like muscle, like when he did the karate game. Yes, there. yes, yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I love Scott these. Hall's in there too. Yeah, that's a thing. A lot of yeah. people only know Scott Hall from when he started off as Razor Ramon, maybe the Diamond Stud. That's right. He was a big part of the, well, not big, but he was a part of the AWA. Yeah. Before that, had a figure and everything. He was kind of their their attempt to recreate Magnum TA. Yeah. That's basically what he was back then. And it's just wild because Magnum TA was going to be NWA's Hogan. Yes, he was. And then Scott Hall was going to be AWA's Magnum TA. Right. And then Scott Hall ended up just becoming WWF Scarface. <laughs> that's like, right. It's, it's wild how that's that all right. worked out. Yeah. Uh, I am I want to take a look at maybe some of these over here that we haven't sure. got to see. Sure. And maybe not my face on Brock Lesnar. Although I will say, Jimmy, as we pan to this, you got my physique down. Oh, it's perfect. You yeah. got my physique yeah. down. Yeah, true to life. True to life. So we're starting to see, like, I, I love, like, the snake here. Some of the accessories that come with those. So the 89 set, notice how the cards are black. Yeah. Every other one was blue. So the 89 set uh, was the last set they did, and it's, it's widely considered the black card set. Yeah. That's what they call it. And there's two different types that came out that year. Some of them were basically, they basically had leftover inventory to sell because mm -hmm. uh, the company wasn't doing well at that time. So they re-released them on a black card. So ones like uh, Savage, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts, the White Shirt Hogan, Ted DiBiase, Big John Studd, those had already been released before on white cards. Okay. They just re-released them on black just to kind of get the inventory out. These ones, like the Haku, Rick Rude, the Ultimate Warrior, uh, Warlord, that was a new one that was actually released as part of that set that year. That's amazing. So, we see, again, very similar Randy Savages to the one that you have, but, yeah, the variants of the cards. Yep. Which figure would you say you have, I don't want to say the most copies of, so to speak, but yep. which superstar of this LJN line do you have the most of? Definitely the Savage, I think, because, number one, they came out twice the white card or the black card and the blue card, and because I have the variant with the white skin, mm -hmm. so I've got three of those. Uh, I mean, there's I've got a lot of the Hogans too because this Hogan came out twice. The others, a uh, and he's the, he's the biggest wrestler of that period. He was, but this one came out on a blue card as well. Uh, that one with the red shirt, and then the original Hogan. So uh, so if you look at that, I've got three of those plus the original set. If I'm gonna get really really particular. The original set came with uh, stands. I don't know if I have any of those out right now. There's one right here. See how there's a stand behind the figure? Yeah. So the original set came with a stand in it like that. And then uh, once they produce multiple sets, they just stop releasing the stand for some reason. So I have a Hogan with the stand in it like that as well. We got Ultimate yeah. Warrior here. I mentioned the physiques. Yeah. He's looking like 06 Triple H, maybe. Yeah, he's a little bit, a little bit chubby. Yeah. For the Ultimate Warrior, and the reason I have two of these is because this is a rare, a very rare one. Uh, the Warrior in the package is pretty sought after, mm -hmm. and so I was able to get my hands on two, and I kept both of them. Okay, now they're a little rare. I see this on all of them. Poster inside. That's right. Is the poster inside that little flap? Yes, like, it is. Uh, what do they look like? How, how are they? It's basically a hollow box. Uh, there's a poster that's probably about this big, mm -hmm. uh, and they're drawings. They're basically just like oh. cartoon versions of the of the uh, wrestler. Are those individually sought after or anything like that? Like there's a bit of a market on eBay for it. Yeah. Like I've had guys offer me, I don't know, depending on who it is, between maybe ten, fifty, hundred dollars okay. if you're lucky. But I personally don't collect those. Now we're gonna take a look at the prototypes. Uh huh. I have a few prototypes. Yeah. Zack Ryder can check out this clip. And Zack Ryder's going to be thrilled. So these are Jimmy's I'm saving this to him because because Zack Ryder said I way <laughs> overpaid for this figure right here. My boss bought the Sergeant Slaughter prototype. Feelings, thoughts, emotions. Well, here's the thing. So Kurt Hawkins threw out this insane number that I was not going to spend anyway. Yeah. So I was denied, but I wasn't going to buy it for that yeah. price. So he bought it for way more than that. So... Congrats, I guess. Yeah. I have it unpainted. The painted one's obviously cooler, but way more money. So I'm actually glad that I don't have it. You're glad that I'm you don't have. I'm glad that you said that because yeah. that will eat him up. I'm sorry, like 
That will eat him up. You spent way too much money. You got ripped off. Yeah, Zack Ryder knows memorabilia, so he knows figures are worth what you're willing to pay. That's what they're worth. So maybe explain to the people who, who don't collect or just kind of new uh, the concept of prototypes. So, yep, so basically these are not made of rubber. These are made out of resin, although the, uh, the middle slaughter here was made of rubber. Mm -hmm. um, these are made out of resin, which is kind of like a hard, almost like a plaster material. Yeah. What happened was they would create the proto prototype, they would do it up because they wanted to take a look before they mass produced it. Mm -hmm. They would want to take a look at it, paint it up to see if they think that it's, you know, where it needs to be before they produced it. The thing that made these all interesting is that they went into way more detail on the prototypes than they did with the finished product. Yeah. Probably again because they were mass produced in China, probably made a big difference. So for example, the George the Animal Steel, the produced type didn't have uh, chest hair, like painted chest hair. Oh wow. The uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooka, the uh, leopard on the on the tights wasn't as detailed on the final okay. figure. Little things like that were different between the prototype and the, uh, the finished product. And uh, so the reason why Zack Ryder was kind of doubting this is because he said that the gear on the slaughter didn't necessarily match up with that time frame. Yeah, so I, I talked to him a lot about it. And so if you look at, this is the Hasbro slaughter. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the painted prototype slaughter and it's very similar, right? The colors are very similar. And I've talked to uh, Zack Ryder about this. He thinks that the somebody working for LJN produced this on their own. Okay. He, he thinks they had a mold because we're pretty sure that they were going to make a slaughter and they had a mold. But he thinks that somebody that worked for the company um, uh, made this, this figure and painted it and did so based on the colors of the Hasbro version. That's now, what we think. explain to me these, because I don't know anything about these. Yeah, I mean, these. Are, so LJN had other stuff that they made aside from the, the, the figures everybody knows about. They made thumb wrestlers. They made stretch wrestlers. Uh, they made the tag teams over here. And they made these giant Hogan and the giant Piper. There's two out of the box right behind you if you want to pick one up. Yeah, I would love to. Yep, right there. Uh, we'll pick up the one that isn't racist. <laughs> Roddy Piper. <laughs> Yeah, that's so. These, these basically are just giant. I don't know if they're supposed to be Barbies wow. for boys or something. Yeah, but they're basically just large versions that had the clothing and everything on them. And they made. They only made the two. They only made the Hogan and the Piper. You have a couple of tag or a few tag teams up here. Yeah, and it's not here, but you also have the new LJ and Style Young Bucks. Yeah, at your it's office. around here somewhere. Uh, it's it's all in your so office. I have two of them. Oh, do you? Yeah, it's around here somewhere. I don't know where the hell it is, but I. Oh, it's right here actually. The Young Bucks one is right here. So, we'll, we'll wait, we'll set up the shot. Yep. There it is. This is the, the Young Bucks style LJN. Yep. Now, so you can see it's very similar. Yeah. Except that one had the WWF branding on it, and this one doesn't. Uh, and I, I thought they were gonna produce a whole set of this, but now I think it was just a one-off for the Young Bucks because they actually put the Young Bucks name on it. Yeah. Unless they did it for, let's say they do SEU, they could put SEU yeah. up there. But that's what they did. Now, at, Maybe explain to people how it got from LJN here to LJN here, because a lot of people won't know that story. Yep, so basically the LJN rights, uh, the IP, the licensing became available. Uh, I know the guy that got the rights for uh, apparel. So I know the yep. guy that got the rights to do t-shirts and stuff. The people that the Bucks are working with got the rights for toys. Okay. And so that's why they're able to produce this stuff, because they basically were able to acquire the IP. So if they made a set like this for All Elite Wrestling, would that be something that that I would be looking in? to cut into doing? Well, here's the funny thing. So I, when the Bucks thing was coming out, I said I would not get it because it wasn't part of the true set, and then I did. So yeah, yeah, you did. I, I remember that. So I maybe remember. I would probably end up getting it. In yeah. The, you know? So out of all these figures, which one would you say your personal favorite? Oh, that's. I mean, hard. the slaughter that's seems true. like a no-brainer because you should, we should look at the Japanese ones down there. Yeah, yeah, let's look at those. Uh, so basically, these are the oldest known action figure line. Oh, uh, cool. from I believe from 1981. Uh, they're called Poppy, P-O-P-Y. Yeah, I know I've got a lot of crap there. <laughs> and uh, oh, oh, thanks well. for thanks for ruining my shit. Thanks yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for ruining your copy. Of <laughs> WWF Full Metal the album yeah. and. WWF music, music two. Volume 2. Yeah. I'm sure you bump that all the time. So you can see there's a Hogan right there. 
and that is pre-red and yellow Hogan from Japan in 1981. That's amazing. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, so again, that is the first known wrestling action figure line from 81, so it precedes Remco, because Remco precedes the LGM line. Yeah. Uh, but that precedes Remco, and uh, they're not that easy to get. I've only got five or six of them. How many are there? I think there's ten. Okay. In the set. Is that and still something you seek? Like, I haven't. I just haven't had time. Sure. I haven't had time. But uh, I do plan to, to, to get it eventually. I just haven't had a chance to look for it. So that's Jimmy Van's office. That's his LJN collection. I uh, hope you guys like this. We might produce some more things. Like maybe Jimmy, because of this video, will buy every Hasbro ever. Oh, maybe he'll buy me every Bone happen. Cruncher ever. Because not there's, there's not that many Bone Crunchers. There's only several hundred. So right. it's, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Make sure you guys leave a thumbs up and subscribe. Until next time, we're out. I'm here with Zack Ryder, and I warned you before we went on the air, you might not like me. My boss bought the Sergeant Slaughter prototype. Uh, which one? The, uh, the, one that, the one that you couldn't uh, buy. Oh, okay. The painted LJM prototype? That one? I, 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 whichever one was at the toy department in Cincinnati. Yes, that is the one. Uh, that's fine. Feelings, thoughts, emotions. Well, here's the thing. So, did you watch the episode at all? Oh, I loved okay, the episode. So, so, Kurt Hawkins threw out this insane number that I was not going to spend anyway. Yeah. So, I was denied, but I wasn't going to buy it for that yeah. price. So, he bought it for way more than that. So, congrats, I guess. Yeah. I have it unpainted. The painted one's obviously cooler, but way more money. So, I'm actually glad that I don't have it. You're glad that I'm you don't have I'm glad that you said that because yeah. that will eat him up. I'm sorry. That will eat him it, up. You spent way too much money. You got ripped off. I love way it. Way too much money. And I'm the thousand dollar broski. Yeah. I, I'll overpay for a figure I want. Yeah. But that was a ridiculous price that he paid. It was. Over 10000 he paid for that. I, oh, I, I know. Nuts. I know. I, I tried to leverage a raise out of that. So I, I saw that episode from the toy department. It actually motivated me to go up there. And I wasn't a toy collector. But now I've started like a little like Kentucky, Cincinnati like figure collection up there. You all did another episode up there on your own channel. Yes. Explain to me the process of starting your own channel and stuff because I'm really liking that content. Okay, so uh, almost a year ago exactly, Hawkins and I started the Major Wrestling Figure Podcast. It's a podcast about, you guessed it, wrestling yes. figures and wrestling collectibles and stuff like that. And we didn't really expect uh, for it to grow as fast as it did. So uh, pretty soon our fans were demanding merchandise and shirts and then we started doing live shows and then we're like, well, we need some YouTube content because the, the Figure It Out show we do with WWE, it was coming out like once a month, if that. We need some regularly scheduled stuff. So we just decided let's, let's go and let's, let's film these, these vlogs of us hunting for toys and you know, if we're on the road and there's a cool store, let's film it like selfie style and just, and just see what happens. And the fans love it and you said you liked it, so yeah. thanks. Yeah, I didn't know that, that store was there before, and so right. I imagine they get some foot traffic based on 100%, that as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's what that's what we do. We uh, you know we'll find these vintage stores, and if it's cool enough to to film something, we'll do it and we'll put it out there and hopefully bring some traffic to their stores. So there are a lot of people that think that because you're in WWE, you don't have the freedom to do that, but you all have a podcast, you all have your own right. channel, all that stuff. So yeah, so the podcast is as Matt and Brian, not Zach and Kurt, but uh, yeah, and the WWE knows about it. We're not hiding it. You know, I, I promote it all the time. We're talking about it right now. So it's very cool to have this. Uh, you know, it's still wrestling related, but it's uh, it's something we do on our own. And to okay, let's say we want to make a, a back scratcher. We don't have to ask somebody to do it. We'll just make some stupid item and we'll sell. It. And it's cool. It's cool to have that creative uh, freedom. So the amount that Jimmy Van spent on that, what figure would you spend that amount on? Hmm. I've never spent that much on one figure. That's insane. Irresponsible. But, I, eh, <laughs> if, and that's a big if, the, are you familiar with the Hasbro figures from the early 90s yes. at all? Okay, so, so Diesel was in the last set that never came out. Now, I have his head, and I have the drawing, but there's no prototype out there that I know of. If the actual hand-painted prototype did come out, I might spend that kind of money on it, if it's out there. I mentioned to you, uh, I just, just started collecting. Right. Got the little Cincinnati, Kentucky figure collection. Sure. What do you think my crown jewel is so far? Just started. What do I think yours is? I, 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 completely uneducated. I don't know. You tell Try me. Hillbilly Jim Thumb Wrestler. I like that's obscure. I found I, it at the toy department. Very obscure figure. I love the Thumb Wrestler, especially Hillbilly Jim. That's a great one. 
Uh, let the people know where they can uh, find your show, where they can oh, find your channel. A major Wrestling Fever podcast, wherever you download your podcast. Uh, we're on YouTube, youtube.com slash Major WFPod. Check it out. I mean, if you if you had figures, uh, you'll enjoy it. If you like figures now, you'll love it. But uh, what, what I like is a lot of people who listen to it just because they're Zack Ryder fans. They're like, oh my God, Like I had these figures as a kid. Now you have me going on eBay, buying my old stuff, or I'm at Target or Walmart and I'm finding the new Mattel stuff, or I never bought a figure in my life and now I'm buying them. So it's cool to be building this, uh, this little figure community of adult men and women who are playing with toys. I love it. <laughs> Zach Ryder, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate, you, appreciate it. it. Thank you. We're out. Now, Jimmy, as we saw your painted LJN prototype, uh, drew the ire of one Zach Ryder. Uh-huh. He, he had some words for you now. You know what's going to be said. But do you have any additional thoughts besides what maybe you said in that video? Uh, no, you know what's funny about Zack Ryder, and, and I kind of said it in the video, you know, he, he did the interview with you, and he said, oh, he he got screwed, he way overpaid, yeah. he got ripped that's what people off. Are about to, that's what people are about to see. Yeah, so, well, they I guess they already would have, but uh, I've talked to Zack Ryder on a number of occasions about action figures and stuff like that, and he's even shown this in some of the, the vlogs that he does. He has been more than willing to pay you know, exorbitant sums when it's a figure that he thinks is worth the money. And so even though he said I got ripped off on the slaughter, I beg to differ. I had no problem paying what I paid. And uh, if it was something that he wanted, he probably would have paid the same. I want to tell you one other little tidbit about Zack Ryder. Uh, and I don't know if I've said this before. So a little while ago, I heard a rumor that a naked edition of Miss Elizabeth was created as part of the LJN line. Uh, and this is probably a couple years ago now, or a year ago anyway, and, when, and I, I, I got a hold of the picture of it. I put the picture on FIFO Select. And as a result of me posting that picture, FIFO Select Patreon now puts up a, are you at least 18 years old pop-up? And they like adulterated our channel because I put up a picture of a naked Elizabeth. It just so happens that I found out about that Naked Miss Elizabeth by Zack Ryder because he owns it. Because he owns it. He owns it? Yes. How much do you think he spent on that? I don't know. I never asked him what he spent on it, but he's the one that told me about it, and I didn't buy it, you know? Yeah. And, and it was probably a situation, again, where one of the LGN makers sure. did it on their own. But he's the one that told me I didn't buy it. He showed me the picture. And, and then I was like, damn, that really did exist. And so we uh, we now are 18-plus uh, on Fight for Select because of that photo. My God. Well, I'll tell you what I spent on my DVD collection, Jimmy. A lot, but about zero over the last five years. WWE Network has rendered it pointless. And you guys have seen Jimmy's LJN collection. You've you've heard Zack Ryder. Now you're going to get a look at my DVD collection. Enjoy. Now, I collected pro wrestling DVDs, specifically WWE DVDs, for quite a while. I want to say almost 10 years. And the advent of the WWE Network effectively eliminated that for me. I liked the documentaries a lot more. And back before the WWE Network, having a pay-per-view DVD actually mattered. Now, everything's on the network in that regard. Uh, they, they put all the pay-per-views up there. They put all the special events up there. All the tribute to the troops and anything like that. They're, they're, they're all up there. The documentaries aren't all up there, but for a while, it looked like that's the direction they were going. And now you see the WWE 24s, you see the WWE 360s, you see a lot of stuff like that that gets put up and you don't see many documentary releases these days. So I don't have many modern titles. Also, WWE doesn't seem to put out Blu-rays much anymore. And that's just the way that things are going now. But I'm gonna carry you through a little bit of what I collected, why I collected, and stuff I'm probably gonna get rid of as well. Now I can't really remember the first DVDs that I collected, so to speak, but I know that some of the first that I sought out were actually TNA pay-per-views. There were a bunch of TNA pay-per-views back then that I really adored and loved. They came out with the best of AJ Styles, phenomenal. I bought these way overpriced at like my local Sam Goody or On Q or something like that and blew way too much money on those. But now Impact Wrestling has their own network too, so a lot of that stuff's on there, so I never actively searched out any of that. They had this Jeff Jarrett DVD that was 
real weird. It was the way that, that one of my friends explained it was it's like you're in church for an entire weekend, but Jeff Jarrett is God. That's that's this DVD. Other than that, they didn't have a ton of documentaries that released. Uh, they did have the best of TNA uh, or the history of TNA year one. And they had uh, Global Impact Japan, which I thought was a really nice get. But other than that, there weren't a lot of great TNA wrestling releases. And I don't have any since they moved to Global or Impact Wrestling. Some of the first WWE DVDs that really got me into it were uh, definitely this one. The Road Warriors, I always liked them a lot growing up. And they had the documentary that came out. So I went and I bought that. It had the, the nice little double disc gimmick there. But... That was also the era where Chris Benoit's DVD came out, and it was very, very good. They they did a quick release of the Eddie Guerrero uh, special that had aired on TV and turned that into a DVD, and I was like, okay, we're really rocking here. We're getting some stories. We're getting a lot of that. That's the stuff I really like. As much as I like wrestling, I like the story behind wrestling even more. And like up here on uh, this DVD rack that I actually had to have made for these, I've got all the documentaries. I've got like Macho Man Story, True Giants, Rock vs. Cena, uh, the CM Punk DVD, which is outstanding. Uh, but I also have some that are still sealed. Like I watched the Jerry the King Lawler feature elsewhere, and I never ended up opening up the Blu-ray that came with it. There's like Triple H, Mankind, Steve Austin. All these are documentary features. Usually wrestlers get one. Sometimes they'll get two. And I've had people say, well, what's your favorite DVD that you own? Uh, without a doubt, it's Undertaker. This is my yard. It's still got the sticker on it from where I had to buy it secondhand. It's in rough shape. But this came out in 2001 before WWE DVDs were really that big. Before it was commonplace to see things like this. And it is an Undertaker documentary, which you don't really see a lot of. They haven't put out a ton of... of career retrospect on The Undertaker, and this was American Badass era. I mean, it's still got the WWF logo on this thing, so it's it's ancient in that regard. I've got a couple more from the WWF era, like this Steve Austin What, and uh, there's one with uh, that covers Lita, there's Hardy Boy's Leap of Faith, so I do have a few older ones here, and those are a little bit tougher to find. Uh, in like 2003, 2004, they started to put out some really half-assed documentaries like the Trish Stratus, uh, Stratus Faction Guaranteed, Rey Mysterio 619. But around that time, they also started to do some cool stuff. Like they would re-release -re some of like the 96, 97 home videos. They had like Andre the Giant, this Degeneration X uh, feature. They had Shawn Michaels' Boyhood Dream. I got all those as well. Uh, some of these are also uh, different kinds of documentaries. Like you got uh, Sean versus Brett, where they talk about their rivalry. Really dig that. You got the greatest superstars of like the 90s, the 21st century, the 80s. Uh, I, I enjoyed that series. Probably my favorite series that WWE did, though, was a look at the specific promotions. Uh, the Triumph and Tragedy of World Class. You have uh, the Rise and Fall of ECW. You have the rise and fall of WCW, the spectacular legacy, the AWA. You've got a lot of that stuff. And the Monday Night War documentary was outstanding. Uh, I, I liked the WWE Network feature, but it seemed like they went over a lot of that multiple times. Uh, Royal Rumble was another good feature that they did, but it seemed like they sped right through that, and I, I wasn't much on that. Some of these have special boxes, which probably don't work anymore. But this Dusty Rhodes one was impossible to keep in good shape. If you see that, it's just in miserable shape. But it comes out like this, and you got these jewel cases that always smash. Like, and it's hard to find a box to replace this. Like, if something happens and my Bobby Heenan DVD case gets cracked, well, that's fine. I can just find a dual sleeved case and replace that. That's fine. If this. American Dream Dusty Rhodes one messes up. Well, it's not so easy because as you see, it opens up like this and it's got these gimmicks and they smash so easily. Originally, you would press this and there would be a few Dusty Rhodes sayings in there 
that ended up not working uh, very long. However, there there is a another cool one here. Cool if you're into ridiculous humor like me. A little uh, pop up suck it there. Let's see if this side still works. It does. It does. Triple H, you know, a little less limber. This is fun if you like that wacky era of DX. But um, down through here, I have more match collections, and it gets into pay-per-view collections and stuff like that. You got your best of Nitros, which I haven't opened. Best of Saturday Night's main event, like greatest, greatest Ultimate Warrior matches. Yeah. But uh, I also really like these Legends of Wrestling series. Ric Flair and Slaughter, Hogan and Backlund, Lawler and Junkyard Dog, and Heat Seekers. And they would just get a bunch of legends, round table, and they'd talk about that subject. And this was from the WWE 24-7 service that was a precursor to the WWE Network. Uh, I really love those. I wish they would do more of them. Uh, another one of my more rare ones is The Twisted Disturbed Life of Kane. It's a three-disc set. It was out briefly in a Walmart. Now, if my history isn't too hot on a lot of these, my apologies. I'm not as hip to some of this as, as other people, but uh, I, I did spend a lot of time collecting these, not necessarily researching them. Another cool series of boxes, and of course the jewel case is broken there. There were histories of the WWE Championship, the Intercontinental Championship, and the Heavyweight Championship. And the Heavyweight Championship one came with a documentary, which again, I really, really loved because the WWE title and the Intercontinental title ones just had matches. So to, again, as I, as I drop legendary moments of WWE, it was nice to see a documentary, but I wish they would have went back and created documentaries for the Intercontinental title and the WWE title as well. I felt really left out, or felt like they really did leave out in that regard. I had mentioned those mid-90s or late-90s re-releases. This is one of them, because Stone Cold said so. A lot of you guys may have uh, seen this on VHS back in the day, and they, they did do a re-release for that on DVD. Speaking of VHS, I have a couple of VHSs, uh, one of which is Chris Jericho, Break the Walls Down, because I haven't been able to find it on DVD yet within a human price range, so I've kind of skipped out on that one. Uh, throughout here, you have like the best of In Your House, best of Raw, all that stuff. Uh, I'll keep those, but what I probably won't keep very long are these pay-per-view DVDs. We've got some WrestleManias, Royal Rumbles, all that. All that's on the network now. Occasionally, you'll get some bonus features. Occasionally, you'll get like a backstage interview or something, but a lot of times they actually include that on the WWE Network feature of these as well. Like, for example, if you go back and watch St. Valentine's Day Massacre, you'll see Big Show doing an interview with his hand taped up and, and bandaged up. That wasn't on the original broadcast. That was actually on the DVD as a bonus feature. So there's a good chance I'm gonna to try to move all of those. Have some more Blu-rays down here. I try to keep them together. But there's some other stuff that I have as well. Um, I, have, I have a few MMA DVDs. Uh, I found a bunch of these rare Pride FC DVDs at like a gas station or something like that. And I was like, okay, a couple bucks, I'm gonna buy those. But I have a series of DVDs. Hardcore Homecoming, that was the uh, independent ECW reunion. They did a, a second round of it, but this was a Jeremy Borash documentary that was a companion piece or maybe a competitor piece to the rise and fall of ECW. It is outstanding, sometimes it lacks direction, but for the quotes alone from New Jack, it's worth it. This was very, very good and a little bit gritty and more in the spirit of ECW, I thought. You have the unreal story of professional wrestling. This aired on A&E in the 1990s at, during wrestling's boom. Uh, very good stuff. It, it taught me a lot about the early days of professional wrestling that I hadn't known. And then before I had any real direction for my collection, I got stuff like the best of CM Punk, Stars of Honor, a Backyard Wrestling DVD, uh, this New Jack hardcore documentary, and of course, I gotta have Ready to Rumble. I got some movies here as well. 
I've got um, The Wrestler. I have uh, both versions of The Wrestler. There's the old one with a bunch of AWA stars. Then there's the more modern one, which is not based on the old one at all, with Mickey Rourke in it. So I, I got a little bit of that as well. I have a Stephanie McMahon fitness DVD that I bought my wife and she did not use, by the way. I have a few more from when I didn't really know what direction my uh, collection was going to go and I bought some PWG DVDs. I don't even know how I wound up with these signed Jim Cornette rookie DVDs. I have not ever read them or watched them or what, whatever you might do with something like that. Uh, I've got the Hulk Hogan, No Holds Barred, obviously. Uh, a, a 99 cent WWE unauthorized DVD with some Rock Maven lookalike. I don't even know what this is. I think it's a series of shoot interviews. Uh, Vive Guerrero, which is some of his matches outside of WWE. 44 Ways to Kill You with a Pimento, Best of Chikara. Uh, another PWG uh, DVD where you got like Scott Lost and Daniel Bryan, Christopher Daniels, Kazarian, uh, <laughs> Generico, Jack Evans, Kevin Owens. It kind of shows you who all went through there. So a lot of cool stuff there too. I have the Sheik DVD uh, and lots of different things in that regard that, that were released but have some sort of feature about them. Uh, a lot of the PWG stuff I'm probably going to sell a lot of the, the, the stuff that is just events, I'll probably get rid of. Those aren't necessary to my collection because all that stuff's available digitally now. So it's not that important to me. One pay-per-view that I am definitely going to keep though, ECW Guilty is Charged 2001. There's a story behind this. This is uh, ECW's last pay-per-view and uh, therefore their last DVD effectively. But I was deep into my collecting days, and this was pretty expensive online. It was about 75, 80 bucks. And I went to the Front Porch, which is a local bar, grill, to watch UFC fights with the famed Nikita Krylov fan, if you all know him. He said, hey, if you buy me a pitcher of beer, I'll give you whatever DVD you want out of my collection. This is the one I saw. It cost me $5 for this DVD that was selling for about 65, 70 at the time. Really dug it. Now, as I was doing this, I thought probably a pretty good idea to just give you guys an extended look at what exactly I have here. Uh, as mentioned, these are the documentaries. You have Macho Man, True Giants, uh, Brett the Hitman Heart, The Dungeon Collection, Rock vs. Cena Once in a Lifetime, which actually wasn't, but a series of Blu-rays. This Brock Lesnar is actually a re-release collector's edition. Uh, this Shield DVD or Blu-ray sucks. You got the 50-year the history of WWE, which was very, very underwhelming. And the NWO revolution. This was really when I could tell that they were going towards the shorter features as opposed to the 90-minute, two hours, sometimes three-hour long features that they had. Uh, so a series of Blu-ray documentaries there, or, or at least features to some regard. Uh, I thought the Ric Flair DVD ruled. That's one of my favorites. Uh, Bret Hart's is pretty good. Mankind's amazing. Uh, but there are some like, like Triple H that weren't quite complete, but he's still got a feature. You see Ricky Steamboat, Edge. Uh, Edge's was amazing. Chris Jericho's, again, very incomplete. I have a lot of people saying, which is my least favorite? Well, my least favorite, without a doubt, it, it came down to two. At the time, probably one of Batista's. It just wasn't put together very well. Can't remember which one was which, whichever came out first. But I wasn't big on that. And definitely the superstar Billy Graham story because, let's be real, the man's an egotistical, crazy asshole. So I, I didn't necessarily really care that much to see that. Uh, the most surprising that I enjoyed, Roddy Piper. I was never a huge fan of his growing up, but his story is fascinating. Uh, we also have the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, which has, I believe, been taken out of print. They don't make that anymore. Uh, very controversial, led to a couple lawsuits, or maybe one lawsuit. Mr. Perfect, Bobby Heenan, Brian Pillman, Jake Roberts. Jake Roberts is one that I think WWE could stand to re-release or add to because of his history and his career and all the things that have happened. 
Uh, there are probably like a hundred Shawn Michaels DVDs out there. This guy has so many DVDs. There's the Click DVD. There's the Shawn Michaels story. There's uh, this DX DVD. He's featured on Greatest Stars of the 90s and probably the 2000s as well. But also, uh, you go through and there, there's Mr. WrestleMania. There's the Greatest Factions that he's featured on. There's just a ton of different match collections that he is heavily featured on. Uh, but his, his prior appropriate documentary is pretty good as well. Uh, Randy Orton's, uh, again, I, I'm not big when they do one like halfway through people's career, and that's what happened here. Uh, they, this twist of fate, Matt and Jeff Hardy story. So this one is particularly interesting because uh, it is a two-disc set. And, man, this is back when they used to put these security strips on there because people were stealing this stuff all the time. But this was interesting because there was a Matt Hardy disc and then there was a, if I can ever fold it over, a Jeff Hardy disc. So each had their own story, their own documentary, their own bonus features. I thought that was very, very cool. I thought that was appropriate. There's my media pass from Double or Nothing. Uh, this Triple H one is a very early documentary, 2002. And then we get into some of the, the older documentaries here. Uh, we have Stone Cold Steve Austin's What? Hulk Still Rules. This is My Yard, The Hardy Boys Leap of Faith. Uh, this Brock Lesnar DVD is actually this re-release. But I just kept it because I already had it. You had uh, the lead. Now, as I was doing this, I thought probably a pretty good idea to just give you guys an extended look at what exactly I have here. Uh, as mentioned, these are the documentaries. You have Macho Man, True Giants, uh, Brett the Hitman Heart, The Dungeon Collection, Rock vs. Cena Once in a Lifetime, which actually wasn't, but a series of Blu-rays. This Brock Lesnar is actually a re-release collector's edition. Uh, this Shield DVD or Blu-ray sucks. You got the 50-year the history of WWE, which was very, very underwhelming. And the NWO Revolution. This was really when I could tell that they were going towards the shorter features as opposed to the 90-minute, two-hour, sometimes three-hour long features that they had. Uh, so a series of Blu-ray documentaries there, or, or at least features to some regard, uh, I thought the Ric Flair DVD ruled. That's one of my favorites. Uh, Bret Hart's is pretty good. Mankind's amazing. Uh, but there are some like, like Triple H that weren't quite complete, but he's still got a feature. You see Ricky Steamboat, Edge. Uh, Edge's was amazing. Chris Jericho's, again, very incomplete. I have a lot of people saying, which is my least favorite? Well, my least favorite... Without a doubt, it, it came down to two. At the time, probably one of Batista's. It just wasn't put together very well. Can't remember which one was which. Whichever came out first. But I wasn't big on that. And definitely the superstar Billy Graham story because, let's be real, the man's an egotistical, crazy asshole. So I, I didn't necessarily really care that much to see that. Uh, the most surprising that I enjoyed Roddy Piper. I was never a huge fan of his growing up, but his story is fascinating. Uh, we also have the self-destruction of the Ultimate Warrior, which has, I believe, been taken out of print. They don't make that anymore. Uh, very controversial, led to a couple lawsuits, or maybe one lawsuit. Mr. Perfect, Bobby Heenan, Brian Pillman, Jake Roberts. Jake Roberts is one that I think WWE could stand to re-release or add to because of his history and his career and all the things that have happened. Uh, there are probably like a hundred Shawn Michaels DVDs out there. This guy has so many DVDs. There's the Click DVD. There's the Shawn Michaels story. There's uh, this DX DVD. He's featured on Greatest Stars of the 90s and probably the 2000s as well. But also... Uh, you go through and there, there's Mr. WrestleMania, there's the greatest factions that he's featured on, there's just a ton of different match collections that he is heavily featured on. 
Uh, but his, his prior appropriate documentary is pretty good as well. Uh, Randy Orton's, uh, again, I, I'm not big when they do one like halfway through people's career, and that's what happened here. Uh, they, this twist of fate, Matt and Jeff Hardy story. So this one is particularly interesting because uh, it is a two-disc set. And, man, this is back when they used to put these security strips on there because people were stealing this stuff all the time. But this was interesting because there was a Matt Hardy disc, and then there was a, if I can ever fold it over, a Jeff Hardy disc. So each had their own story, their own documentary, their own bonus features. I thought that was very, very cool. I thought that was appropriate. There's my media pass from Double or Nothing. Uh, this Triple H one is a very early documentary, 2002. And then we get into some of the, the older documentaries here. Uh, we have Stone Cold Steve Austin's What? Hulk Still Rules. This is My Yard, The Hardy Boys Leap of Faith. Uh, this Brock Lesnar DVD is actually this re-release. But I just kept it because I already had it. You had uh, the leap. Have a little bit of everything through here and through there and up here. If you have any questions about this, let me know. Again, I haven't collected in years, probably about four or five. I'm going to start buying the documentaries again eventually, but I'll also be getting rid of some of this. So if there's a pay-per-view DVD that you want, hit me up. Let me know. I might get rid of it. Until next time, guys, hope you enjoyed this collector's edition of Fightful and listen, your boy, until next time, we're out. Jimmy, what, what did you think of my DVD collection that you absolutely sat through and watched <laughs> in entirety? Uh, I talked about this a week or two ago, and I don't want to disrespect your collection, uh -huh. but we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Back when I had my old site, they used to send me every single one that came out, and so... They, uh, they didn't send you The Undertaker, The Last Ride, though, did they? I had all of them from the period of about 97, 98, right up through until about 2007 or 2008. So over about a 10 year period, I had all of them. Uh, and then I actually on my own informed them, by the way, I shut the site down two years ago because I wasn't watching any of them. I kept them in the cellophane. So I informed them that I shut down the site and then they stopped sending them. Well, joke's on you, Jimmy, because before I was born, LJN used to send me all their action figures <laughs> in boxes, right. complete prototypes, yeah. all that. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Happy holidays. Jim Happy holidays. From, from Sean Ross Sapp and Scrooge himself, Jimmy Van, we're out. <laughs>